it's a cliche that you need a great offensive line in the NFL. Is it true? We're going to talk about it today on Locked On Jets. You are Locked On Jets, your daily New York Jets podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. The Locked On Jets podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. It's Wednesday, July 19th, 2023, and I'm your host, John B. from GangGreenNation.com. Thanking you so much for making the show your first listen or first watch every day. Subscribe to this show for free on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts so that you'll get new episodes as soon as they're posted. If you're listening on a podcast source and enjoy the show, please give this episode a five-star review. If you're watching on YouTube, give this episode a big thumbs up. These things help us out and help other Jets fans find Locked On Jets. Today we have our weekly mailbag. Each Wednesday, we try and do a mailbag show with listener questions. Last week, we kept trying to do a mailbag, but news events kept breaking, hard knocks, the Quinn and Williams contract extension. So we're finally able to do a mailbag show. And thanks so much to everybody who sent in questions. Try and get to as many mailbag questions as I can today. Our first question, hi, John, I'm a huge fan. Like most Jets fans, I am very concerned about the Jets offensive line. However, I'm curious exactly what the correlation is between a great between elite offensive line play and winning a championship. It just seems to me that the team who has the best offensive line usually is not the team that wins it all. Kansas City and Philadelphia have great lines, but that is not typically the case, such as the Burrow-led Bengals, the Rams with Stafford, etc. Let me know your thoughts. Well, I, I, there's this is a really good question, and there are a number of different layers to it. Uh, what I would say, number one overall, is that I think there's probably a greater correlation between quarterback play and winning a championship than there is offensive line play. I think, and I've looked at this from a number of different angles. I've tried to find as many studies as I can. I've tried to look at as many statistics as I can. I do think that there is a correlation between offensive line play and having success and bad offensive line play and having failure in this league. Now, yes, you can look through the years and find bad Super Bowl teams that had bad offensive lines. I mean, the Bengals, just two years ago is a good example of that. If you want to go back, there was a back-to-back season where the champion had a pretty bad offensive line. That was uh, the Seahawks in 2013, and their line was shaky. And you may remember there was a guy the Jets signed, Breno Giacomini, who was a right tackle. Really, was not that good. He was the starting right tackle on the Seattle line. Seattle was able to work around it because you know everything else on that roster was really good. First of all, you had Marshawn Lynch, so run blocking was not really as important as it would be for other teams. You also had a young Russell Wilson, the quarterback who was playing very efficiently. He was taking full advantage of having a great back in Marshawn Lynch. Those Seahawks ran play action very effectively. And they had the number one defense in the league that year, a defense that shut down Denver, who was the number one offense in the Super Bowl. Seattle won that game 43 to eight. So such a dominant roster. Otherwise, having a dominant offensive line was not that significant for them. The next year uh, with New England, Tom Brady was so great. And the, the, the New England New England also had a really good defense. That was the year Darrell Rivas was with the Patriots. That was 2014. People kind of forget because typically through their run, the Patriots had a good offensive line because they had Dante Scarnecchia, who was a legendary offensive line coach. Dante Scarnecchia actually retired and then came back in 2016. So Skarnecchia was not there for the 2014 championship and the New England line was really not that good, but because Brady got the ball out so quickly, they were kind of able to work around it. So there are absolutely exceptions of te- uh, teams that have bad offensive lines that can go a long, a long way. So when I've looked into this, it, it, what, one thing that becomes clear is that a, you know you can work around anything. You know, you, if you have bad receivers, you can make up for it if, if other parts of your team are strong. I mean, that's I think outside of quarterback, there's no there's no real one spot where you have to be great in the NFL. But I do think offensive line, if it's not as strongly correlated with winning as quarterback is, I think it's still pretty high up there. I, I do think that a bad offensive line really can hurt your team. If you have a if you have like the worst offensive line in the league, odds are you're going to be a very bad football team. And that I think that that kind of proves itself when you look through the data when you look through teams where they've struggled 
And it's almost one of those things where a really bad offensive line might hurt you more than a really good offensive line helps you. Now, if you have a great offensive line, odds are you're not going to be the worst team in the NFL. But I think the most important thing is just to have a credible line. If you have a credible line and you have great skill players, then you've got a legitimate shot. Um, Now, I think there are some areas where the offensive line obviously has a big impact. I, I always say this, the first couple of yards on a run play, if they're not blocked well, if your guy's getting contacted in the backfield consistently, you're not going to have a very good run game. More significantly, though, is the role the offensive line plays in pass protection. You know, about five years ago, the website Pro Football Focus posted an article, and it was really about, I think it was almost for fantasy purposes, but they actually took 10 years worth of data, and they found that the typical passer has a passer rating of 98.5 from a clean pocket. And that drops to 73.3 when under pressure. So that's a pretty big difference. 98.5 versus 73.3. So if you're, if the typical quarterback has a 98.5 passer rating when, when under a clean pocket, that almost means that if you protect your quarterback, the average quarterback is going to be Josh Allen, at least as a thrower, you know, maybe, maybe they want the running skills, but that's pretty good. And you've seen this through through recent NFL history. I mean, these advanced stats are, have not been around that long. But you see, there are a lot of very shaky quarterbacks who, if you just look at their clean pocket numbers, they look pretty good. Now, the the typical passer being a seventy three point three percent rated. Uh, I'm sorry, seventy three point three passer rating under pressure. So that means your average quarterback goes from being Josh Allen when throwing from a clean pocket to Zach Wilson when they get under pressure, because that's around what Zach Wilson's career passer rating is, or that's what's around what Zach Wilson's passer rating last year was. So it's a pretty big difference. And now of course, great quarterbacks can figure out, no understand how to operate under pressure, but you don't want your quarterback under pressure frequently. So I guess what it comes down to is there, there are pretty clear ways that an offensive line matters. And I think, Ultimately, you just don't want it to be a disaster. You'd love to have the greatest offensive line in the league, but I think it's fair to say that if you have a great offensive line and you don't have skilled players, you're probably not going anywhere. But I think the inverse of that is true also. I mean, there's so many different positions in the NFL. If you have a great great group of skilled players and your offensive line is terrible, you're also probably not going anywhere. If you have a great offense and a bad defense, you know, it's tough. Great defense, bad offense. Well, Jets had that last year. They went seven and ten. So I think each component matters. Now, I think football, obviously, it's a game of aggression. The trenches are the, are really where a lot of the action happens. So I think it's an interesting question about offensive line versus skill players. Ultimately, ultimately, though, I do think offensive line matters quite a bit. And I think you I, I think you at least want to avoid being terrible there. And I think if you're if you're credible in the offensive line, then you've got a shot in this league. If you're not credible, then you're gonna have a really tough time. Now, head here on the Lockdown Jets podcast, we will continue this mailbag show. We're going to turn our attention to a couple of young defensive ends the Jets have. The Jets have gone defensive end in back-to-back years. What are proper expectations this season for Jermaine Johnson and for Will McDonald? Well, we'll talk about it as we continue this mailbag edition of the Lockdown Jets podcast. Today's episode of Locked On Jets is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook. You can take your first swing at betting Major League Baseball on FanDuel and get 10 times your first bet amount in bonus bets up to $200. That's right. If you bet $20, you'll land $200 in bonus bets, win or lose. That's 200 you can spend betting everything from the money line to the over under to who you think is going to be the fir- hit the first home run. Now, if you're a Yankee fan, you may not want to put money down on that team. It's turning into a very ugly season for the New York Yankees. Uh, I don't want to spoil last night's game because it was a late game, but let's just say things did not go well in Anaheim. So let's stay away from the Yankees, but you can bet on FanDuel, and it's an app that's safe, secure, and super easy to use. Plus, when you win, you can get paid instantly. There's no better place to bet on Major League Baseball than FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. So sign up today and visit FanDuel.com slash LockedOn to get up to $200 in bonus bets. Again, that's FanDuel.com slash LockedOn. FanDuel, official partner of Major League Baseball. Thank you so much for making Locked On Jets your first listener, first watch every day. Big shout out to everydayers, folks who listen to this podcast Monday through Friday. And if you're new to the show, this is a daily podcast covering the New York Jets. Tomorrow on Locked On Jets, we may focus on what happens today when players report. It's an exciting day for the New York Jets. 
and we'll talk about it tomorrow on Locked On Jets. We continue now with our weekly mailbag. Our next question, given Jermaine Johnson was a first-round pick and this is his second season, what are reasonable expectations for him? What would he have to do to, to not be classified as a disappointment given that he was a first-round pick? And what about Will McDonald? What is the minimum you hope to see from him given where he was picked? So, yeah, the Jets keep investing on the defensive line uh, in the first round. Not a bad strategy. Very important position in Robert Sala's defense. Really important to have a good defensive line no matter where you are. So, Jermaine Johnson wasn't just a first-round pick last year. Jets traded up to get him. So, the Jets really gave up a second-round pick and a third-round pick to move up to grab him in the first round, which tells you that at that point, he was probably the top-rated player on the Jets board by far. And... He had kind of a quiet rookie season, and part of it, I think, was just that the Jets were very deep up front, a defensive line, maybe the position with the most depth on the team. You you could argue corner, but defensive line's up there. So the Jets kind of brought Jermaine Johnson along slowly. Uh, what I think Jermaine Johnson needs to do is develop into a good starter this year. You know, he's kind of on the old. He was kind of on the older side when he was drafted, so he's closer to his physical prime than a lot of uh, first round picks were. So I think it's this is kind of a make or break season for Jermaine Johnson. Now, what would he need to do to not be a disappointment? Well, given where he was drafted, and more importantly, give, given what the Jets traded to move up to get him, I mean, I think he's got a, I would say, like an eight sack guy who plays the run really well. I, I don't think he needs to be a ten sack guy necessarily. And I think what the Jets wanted in him, and you know, when you looked at his his film in college, he was a guy who played the run well. And if you, you know, if you're if you're a guy who can play the run well. That makes a difference because that means you can be on the field the whole game. I know the Jets rotate their defensive line in and out, but that means he's not going to be like a Bryce Huff kind of guy who, while well, Bryce Huff is excellent, the Jets don't feel like they can put him on the field on early downs. The Jets feel like Bryce Huff can only come on the field in passing downs. And I don't mean to say this to disparage Bryce Huff in any way. It's just the different types of players that you've got. And a player who can play the run you know, maybe doesn't need to – rush the passer quite as effectively, but at a defensive end, at the defensive end position, especially in this league, you got to have, you got to be able to get after the quarterback. So I'd say like an eight sack guy for Jermaine Johnson, eight sack season for Jermaine Johnson and playing the run really well for Will McDonald. Look, he's a bit of a project, you know, maybe he'll surprise us. Maybe he'll put it together sooner. What I'm hoping to see from him is just a guy who does not look completely overwhelmed on the field. I'm looking for a guy who, you know, looks does it looks like he he's comfortable being on an NFL field where you know he uses those long arms and maybe he gets like three sacks. You know, occasionally flashes something special where you say, "Wow, if he does that consistently, that's we've really got something here." And you know, it's all about for Will McDonald. If you see those flashes, you could say, "All right, if we develop him this off season next year, he could be a, a really a really productive player." So, Will McDonald, the expectations are low. Or I think for for a guy who was drafted with Will, Will McDonald's profile, who still needs a lot of technical refinement, I don't think it's fair to expect him to step into the NFL and dominate on day one. I think you're just hoping to see that he, you know, he's not totally overwhelmed. And I think if he does that, then you'll be feeling you'll be feeling pretty good about things. Our next question, John: How fluent are you in the salary cap? Assuming he plays two seasons, if they restructure Rogers' contract and designate him as a post June first cut then would they be able to spread out his cap hit over three to four years and not take on any dead cap money until 2026? So there's a lot there. Um, so the way it typically works when a player retires is that the cap hits kind of work the same as if a player is cut. And if a player is cut, what happens is all of the, all of the unpaid bonus money or all of the bonus money that hasn't counted against the cap it mean the bill immediately comes due. So let's say that hypothetically, heading into the season before the deal was redone, uh, Rogers was set to get a sixty, and that's six zero million dollar bonus. And the bonus payments essentially are spread out over the life of the contract. When we're talking about the cap, so a sixty million dollar bonus. Rogers had four years left on his contract, so. It's a good deal for the player because Rogers would have gotten the full $60 million up front. So you get, you get a $60 million check cut to him. But the way the Jets would be charged on the cap is that it, because there were four years left on the contract, $15 million would count this year, $15 million next year, $15 million in 2025, $15 million in 2026. 
So let's say hypothetically Rodgers retired after this season. I know the question was after two seasons, but I'm just trying to explain how this works. So after this season, the Jets have already paid the first $15 million against the cap. But if Rodgers retires, it kind of functions as though as though he was cut. And that means the full $45 million bill becomes due. Now, if he retired after two seasons, let's say let's say he got the $60 million bonus, retired after two seasons. Okay, well, this year the $15 million would be paid. Next year he plays, the $15 million would be pay- paid again. After that, there's $30 million left. So if he retires after two seasons, the Jets get the full $30 million bill. Now, depending on when Rodgers retires, they could actually cut that in half. Because if he retires after June 1st, and this would really essentially come down to if the Jets asked him and he agreed to wait until wait until after June 1st to file the paperwork, you could cut it in half and spread it out over two seasons. So if he retires after one season, all right, again, 15, 15, 15, 15. Those are the cap hits for the bonus. If he retires after one season, $15 million is already paid because he played in 2023. There's $45 million left. What you could do is if he waited until after June 1st, you could get it to 225 next year, and then 22.5 the year after. So you could split it over two seasons. I don't think you could split it over three to four, though. I think think because the way, unless I I believe that this is the case, because my understanding is that if a player retires, it essentially functions as though he's been cut. So they would have to, essentially the bill would come due. I don't think you could spread a retired player's payments over three to four years. I think if you hold off on filing the retirement paperwork until after June 1st, you can spread it out over two seasons. And uh, no matter what happens, I would expect that's kind of what the Jets will end up doing here. Um, And we'll see, though. And I think a lot of it comes down to what the contract he'll play under is because we still don't really know that. The Jets still have not restructured that contract. He's still slated to make 1.1 to 1.2 this year and then 107 next year, which obviously is not going to be the case. So we'll, we'll see what happens. But essentially... You can spread it out over. You can spread out the rest of the cap it over two years. I don't think you can do it three to four years, though. Now, head here on the Locked On Jets podcast. We will continue our weekly mailbag. We'll talk about which undrafted free agent could end up surprising us in making the roster. That's we continue this Wednesday mailbag edition of the Locked On Jets podcast. This is the Locked On Jets podcast. On this Wednesday, we're doing our weekly mailbag show. Our next question, John: Which undrafted free agent do you think will end up making the fifty-three man roster? Interesting question. And it's not easy because the Jets actually have a pretty decent roster this year. In seasons past, the Jets have had like one of the worst rosters in the NFL. So there's been a much easier path for an undrafted rookie. But that said, there aren't that many seasons where you see more than one UDFA make the roster. So it's possible nobody makes it. What I'm looking for this year, first of all, I'm looking for a guy who maybe has the tool to play in the tool get overlooked in the draft process this year. It's tough because generally speaking, this was not viewed as a particularly strong draft class. So the, the perception is that a lot of guys who were drafted this year would be an undrafted free agent in typical years. So that's tricky. I think you also have to avoid positions where there's a log jam. Uh, you know, there are a couple of wide receivers the Jets signed as undrafted free agents. The problem for them is they're already like, if we're, if we're assuming Corey Davis is going to remain here, there are already like five guaranteed roster spots going to wide receivers. You've got Garrett Wilson. You've got Alan Lazard. If Davis is here, he's going to be on the roster. Randall Cobb and Mecole Hardman. So really, there might only be one spot left at wide receiver, which is tough because you still have Denzel Mims around. You have Irv Charles. I mean, there are guys who could potentially take that role. So I don't think it's going to be wide receiver. A defensive line's tough. So the guy I'm looking at uh, is a safety that the Jets drafted. Uh, Trey D. or they, I'm sorry, they didn't draft him. It's not drafted free agent, but the player I'm looking at is Trey Dean, who's a safety out of Florida, who is a good tackler. Uh, I think one of the, you know, probably the biggest reason he fell out of the draft was that his time speed was not great. And one of the things I look at is I wonder, based on the way the Jets run their defense and based on what they've done with certain prospects in the past, could this be a guy they look at potentially as a conversion to linebacker type of guy? But even if they're not, so I look at what are the two weakest positions on the roster, at least as far as depth goes, it might be linebacker and safety. And I could see Trey Dean perhaps fitting either role. You know, if they don't think he's fast enough to play safety, maybe they move him to linebacker. And it could come down to whether Quan Alexander returns, of course, because Quan Alexander could take up a roster spot. But if you're looking at a guy who has like maybe two different paths to the roster, and both of them are some of the least, uh, the positions where the Jets have the least depth, Trey Dean could fit the role. And he's just a good football player. I think that 
you know, is he athletic enough to play in the NFL? That's an open question. But one of the things I look at is, is there a guy who maybe fell because his athletic testing wasn't as good as, as other guys, but maybe can he make up for that because he plays faster than he's timed? And so that's, if I had to guess somebody, I'd say Trey Dean, the safety out of Florida. We'll see though. I mean, I, I think anybody who's not drafted free agent kind of has a lot working against him because it's not like the team invested a draft pick in you and you know, you're probably near the bottom of the roster to begin with. And I think any undrafted free agent essentially has to prove that they belong on the roster. If you're like a first round pick, you essentially have to play your way, way out of a starting role unless your team's already established at, at your position. Whereas if you're a, you're an undrafted free agent, they're going to assume that you're not going to make the roster that you have to kind of earn your way there. And the other, the other thing that I feel like almost works against the undrafted free agents now is the expanded practice squads. You know, practice squads have, have gone way up in number. You can keep more players on your practice squad than you used to be able to. And I feel like that works against them because teams always say, well, if they're, if they're thinking about keeping a guy or cutting an undrafted free agent, they'll always say, well, we can just put him on the practice squad because, you know, as an undrafted free agent, you probably were not that hot of a commodity, so teams, you know, teams feel like they'll be able to sneak you through waivers, get you on the practice squad, and that way we can keep another guy. And sometimes that works against you. I mean, last year, even though he was a drafted player, uh, Jason Pinnock, Jets, I think the Jets tried to sneak him on the practice squad to keep like a, another player, and he ended up getting uh, poached by the Giants. So it doesn't always work that way. But I feel like that's something that kind of plays into team strategies is, is that the fact they think they the fact they think they can get undrafted free agents onto the practice squad, and then keep another player in, in their place. And our next question, this one, this question is a long question. I was asked to read the entire question in 2008, Brett Favre completed 65.7% of his passes for 3,472 yards, 22 touchdowns and 22 interceptions on route to a nine and seven record. Favre also fumbled 10 times, only losing two and never broke 300 yards passing in any of those 16 games for the jets. He had a, 81 passer rating, which ranked 21st out of 32 quarterbacks, and a 43.4 QBR, 27th out of 32 in the league. Favre essentially played identically to how Matt Ryan played for the Colts this past season. Matt Ryan started 222 games for the Atlanta Falcons before going to the Colts in 2023. Rodgers started 223 games for the Packers before joining the Jets. Favre started 253 games for the Packers before joining the Jets. Ryan and Favre crumbled under the new regime's under every metric of if, with every metric of passing efficiency degrading, both of their interception rates jumped around by around thirty percent, while their touchdown rates dropped by, by about twenty five percent. Interestingly enough, both saw that their both saw their completion rates slightly increase, while their yards per attempt dropped an average of around eight percent, and their sack rates both increased. If we apply this to Aaron Rodgers, then we can project a touchdown rate of four point seven percent, an interception rate rate of two point seven percent a completion percentage of 66%, yards per attempt of 6.5%, and 33 passing attempts per game. That would result in a final stat line of a 66% completion rate, 3,647 yards, 16 touchdowns, and 15 interceptions. Is this good enough? So very long question. The, the question essentially is, if Aaron Rodgers declines at the rate Matt Ryan did going to the Colts last year or Brett Favre did coming to the Jets back in 2008, is it good enough? And I think the answer is pretty obvious. Jets are looking for way better than Matt Ryan last year. Jets are looking for way better than Brett Favre in 2008. And Favre, you know, like I know what people are going to say, the people say it all the time, that 2008 season has become like one of the most misremembered things in Jets history. People say oh, the Jets were 8-3. and three. Favre was much shakier than people remember during that 8-3 and three stretch. In fact, during the month of October that year, he was maybe the worst quarterback in the NFL. He was terrible in October. And the Jets just kind of lucked out because they had a ridiculously soft schedule that month. So they were able to kind of skate by Cincinnati, a team that wasn't very good, and Kansas City, which was at the time one of the worst teams in the NFL. And they lost at Oakland, which is a team, team that was not that good to begin with. Uh, so the whole far thing is, I think people say, oh, they were, he was great before he got injured. He really wasn't. If you watch that, the flow of that season, yeah, there were some great individual games. Like, you know, I think he threw six touchdown passes against Arizona. But Favre was much more up and down that season than people remember. And one of the things that, you know, it was, 2008 was just a weird season in the NFL because it, it was it, the Giants and Patriots were the two best teams in the league. They had just met in the Super Bowl the year before. It seemed predestined that they'd meet again in the Super Bowl. And then... Uh, Brady, Tom Brady got injured like the first quarter of the first game. He tore his ACL, so he was out for the season. 
and the Giants were rolling along, and then Plaxico Burris had his incident. I mean, it's kind of similar to like what would happen, and I, I don't want this to happen, but it was kind of like, it's kind of like if Kansas City, like if, if we were looking at Kansas City and Philadelphia this season, and we're expecting them to be in a Super Bowl rematch, and then Patrick Mahomes suffers an injury, and then AJ Brown suffers an injury. And both those teams see their seasons derailed. And I hope that doesn't happen because those are both great players. But that's kind of what happened in 2008. And they created like this really weird season in the NFL. And there were all kinds of weird things happening. I mean, the other good teams in the AFC were, you know, the Colts and Chargers both got off to a really slow start to their season. So it was just like there was this really weird vacuum in the AFC. And I think also to a degree in the NFC that year when you look at the teams that succeeded. So the bottom line, though, is that the Jets did not trade for Aaron Rodgers to be the Brett Favre of 2008 or the Matt Ryan of last year. They traded for him to be a top 10 quarterback, if not higher. And if he's if he falls short of that, this trade is not going to work. But I think the Jets are the Jets would not have made this trade if they were expecting that. I think the Jets were expecting a much better performance from Aaron Rodgers. And rightly so. They should expect a much better performance from Aaron Rodgers because – you don't give up a first round pick for a 39 year old quarterback. If you think that they're going to play like that. And our last question, are you slightly curious about seeing Zach Wilson in preseason games to see if he's improved in the off season with a new offensive coordinator and a real mentor in Rogers? Well, the mentor thing, I, I don't think the mentor thing is going to make a difference to be honest with you. I, I think, I don't think that the mentor issue was, was what derailed Zach Wilson. Um, It'll, I guess it'll be worthwhile seeing him on the film I'm ex- on the field. I'm expecting him to play well because he's a guy with starting experience going up against backups. Um, I, I think the Zach Wilson thing, though, it's a longer term deal. Zach Wilson's going to it, it's going to take a while. If Zach Wilson's going to turn around, it's not going to be an immediate thing. Yeah, he'll probably look better just because he's playing in preseason against you know practice squad level players. But uh, I don't think it's going to make that big of a difference. Uh, I, and again, I, I don't think this mentor thing makes as much of a difference as people want to make it out to be. I mean, people always went on about what a great mentor Josh McCown was. I'm sure he was. I'm sure there, there's some utility to mentors where they show you, maybe show you how to work, how to study the film. But ultimately, you can either play or you can't. And jo- while Josh McCown was a great mentor, there really aren't many Josh McCown quarterbacks who were protégés of his that ended up being good. Um you know, he, I, if Zach Wilson is good, though, it's not going to be immediate. He His game essentially needs to be deconstructed and reworked. So I don't think it's going to be the type of thing that happens overnight. And even if he plays well in preseason, that doesn't mean he's going to be able to step in and start games this year. And that's why Aaron Rodgers is here. Anyway, that's all for today's episode. This has been the Lockdown Jets podcast, part of the Lockdown Podcast Network. Your team every day is our motto. As always, if you enjoyed the show, hit the subscribe button where you're watching or listening so that you'll never miss an episode. If you're listening on the podcast, of course, please give this show a five-star review. And if you're watching on YouTube, give this episode a big thumbs up. These things help us out, help other Jets fans find the podcast. Have a great Wednesday, everybody. We'll be back tomorrow to talk more Jets.